I gotta be honest, I am gonna miss the first John study myself. Oh, it's been such a nice, concise sermon series. It's helped me personally, and this week I'm excited because I'm gonna try to summarize, you know, like the, the book as we look at these last few verses. You know what? Let me summarize what I've got out of it. Okay. All right. Um, here's my takeaway. There's nothing you could do that can't be done. Mm. And there's nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Wait a minute. Sounds familiar. There's nothing you could say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. Mm. You know what? There's nothing you can make that can't be made. And there's nothing you can save that can't be saved. But there's nothing you can do, but you can learn how to be you in time. Hmm. Mm. It's easy. Oh man. All you need is love. All you need is love. Cliff, all you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. Yeah. I don't know. I don't feel as good about the series as I did a minute ago. Uh, hopefully, this will have a bigger impact. All right. I hope it's touched you a little more deeply than that. And also, that's an early Christmas present for the Beatles fans out there. But, but anyway, uh, we are at the end of our study. We're looking today at chapter 5 of 1 John, verses 13 through 21. I would note we begin a new series next week. Um, it's called Miraculous Births. Uh, there is a little twist to it. If you've been around these parts for a few years... Stephen and I do a live Christmas drama, uh, and we're doing it at all our six services live, so there'll be a little bit of moving parts, but uh, next Sunday, December 4th, we will be live here at 9.45 and 11, and then the next Sunday after that, we'll be at Village Park doing the same thing, but we will, uh, the Christmas sermon series will begin on the 11th here. Um, Anyway, I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm going to have to, not sure I'm going to be certain days in December, but we're looking forward to it. And today, we're talking about what every, what every believer needs to know. Now, when I was a newlywed, I'd been married a couple of years, in 1994, there was a special emphasis that Northwest Airlines was doing, and it was called the $59 Mystery Fair. Some of you might remember it, but what it is was you'd go buy a ticket to, for $59. And by the way, those of you that have had a few birthdays, isn't it weird how we used to buy airplane tickets? I grew up uh, at the Kroger right next door to the Kroger in a little a strip mall was an American Airlines store. You'd go in the store and you'd buy tickets there. You'd pay money and they would mail these big, thick tickets to your house. Anyway, I know that was millenniums ago, but what would happen is Northwest Airlines was invaded by hundreds of people that wanted the mystery fare. The trick to the mystery fare is that you did not know which city you were going until the day you arrived at the airport. So it was for, spon for spontaneous trip lovers. It wasn't for the organized person that has to know where they're going. And they did get a little pushback because you're thinking, cool, I'm going to go to New York for the weekend or I'm going to New Orleans. And they sent you to Des Moines. I, <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that, I'm just saying. Part of the, quote, fun was the mystery of it all, not knowing what you're going to do. And to many of us, it doesn't sound very exciting <laughs> to not know where you're going. And you think about if you apply that same thought to your spiritual life, Nobody wants a mystery spiritual ticket life. On the day of your death or the day when the Lord comes back at the end of time, you don't want a mystery fair. You want to know where you're going. Is it possible to know where you're going? We're going to look today at verses that answer that question and other things that every believer should know. And first of all, we're going to read verse 13. Well, 1 John chapter 5, it says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, this is the third purpose statement of the book. 
in one chapter 1, verse 4, John says, I write this that you may have joy. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I write this to you so that you may not sin. So, God, so John wanted our joy to be increased as we read this book. He wanted our sin to be decreased as we read this book. But I, I, I sort of view verse 13 as the main purpose statement of the book. Toward the end, we basically learn that the book was written to give assurance of salvation. I would like to encourage you when you struggle with your assurance of salvation to carve out some time for a slow marinated reading of the book of 1 John. Read it over and over again if you're struggling with whether or not you are truly saved. The blank on number one is this, we can know that we have eternal life. I think one of the things John is saying is, first of all, there's a difference between being saved and knowing you're saved. It's possible to have a relationship with God, yet not have certainty about that relationship, which is sort of sad, but it is possible. I like how J.C. Ryle, the late author, says this, faith is the root and assurance is the flower. Don't, doubtless you can never have the flower without the root, but it is no less certain you may have the root, but not the flower. Now, if you see a pretty flower, it's because there's a root it's connected to to give the flower life. There's not any flowers hanging around there by itself, by themselves. But you can have a root with no pretty flower on top. So if the root signifies your salvation, the beautiful flower on top is the assurance. Just because you aren't sure of something there does not mean there's nothing there. I remember finding that out the hard way in 1991. You know what I was going to do? I was going to just say, you know what? I'm tired of wondering. I'm just going to ask that Susie girl out and see if there's anything there. And I basically confessed to her that I'd thought about her through the years of our college time. And I'm just, you know, I knew that her league and my league were in different parts of the universe. But I was just going to see. And so I let her know how I felt. And then I found out something crazy, y'all that she'd had similar thoughts about me through the years. And I'm like, doggone it. Why did, why did I not know that? That girl don't flirt at all, I'll tell you that much. She didn't, <laughs> she didn't even bat her eyes toward me one time in the cafeteria. So there was something there, but we didn't know it. I can't tell you how much better things were when we both knew it. Things were way better. And so I want to let you know this morning that if you know Christ, you can be certain of your relationship with him. Now, it, it kind of rubs us the wrong way when someone is too certain about something, doesn't it? The guy that's going in for the job interview, I'm going to nail this interview and I'm getting that job. We appreciate the sentiment of self-confidence in those settings. But how do you know what others are going to think? How do you know what others are going to bring to the table? It sounds arrogant. And it sounds arrogant to some to say, I know that I know that I know that I am born again and I have eternal life and I'm going to heaven when I die. And someone would say, aren't you a little bit big on yourself there? A little bit maxed out on your own abilities? Well, no, here's the thing. Last week we saw the verse says, if you have, son, if you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you don't have the Son of God, you do not have eternal life. It was clear. Do you believe what he said or not? A lot of us are looking for confidence from our experience rather than our trust in Christ. And I, I want to encourage you this morning that you can have certainty about your relationship with God. Oftentimes we forfeit assurance of salvation due to a lack of spiritual growth. If we're not growing in Christ, we don't, quote, feel very saved. That's what Peter told us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. You've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins if you're not growing in the Lord. And so our, our assurance is forfeited because we're not growing spiritually. I was in the airport at Dallas-Fort Worth yesterday, like a lot of people trying to come back to Florida. And I was going to get some food with some of my kids to feed our crew, and I go past a very sad announcement. There were people that didn't have boarding passes, but they had standby tickets. If you have a boarding pass on a full flight and you resist every offer for a $500 voucher to fly at a later date, you know you're getting on that plane. But if you have a standby, you have no assurance. And I heard the horrible news for the standby people. Hey, the flight is totally booked. Please come to the desk 
for me to book you on another flight. And there was just darkness in, the, <laughs> in that area. They didn't have any assurance. They didn't think they were going to get on, and they didn't get on. Brother, sister, you can know that you have eternal life today. You don't have to walk around with a standby ticket hoping to get on because maybe you're going to do enough or be good enough or go listen to this preacher at First Baptist enough and maybe you'll get into heaven because you had to suffer through his sermons and you gave a few bucks into the plate when you die. Maybe that'll get you to heaven. Look, you can know that you're going to heaven, that you have eternal life if you have a relationship with Christ. If you're trusting in him alone to save you, you can have the joy of knowing. Now, verse 14 through 17 is a treaty on prayer. That's the blank on number two. We can know how God works through prayer, the faithfulness of God in prayer. And there's sort of two divisions of the discussion of prayer. The first one is a very encouraging talk about the importance of assurance in prayer. And then verse 16 through 17 is a very challenging example of a specific type of prayer, that being intercession. Let's do the easier thing first, okay? Verse 14 says, and this is the confidence that we, that we have toward him. So he mentioned confidence about salvation. Now he translates that to having confidence in prayer. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we asked of him. We kind of like that verse, right? It's one of those, don't forget that verse, verses, because John believed that Christ answered prayers, that God answered our prayers. Why did he believe that? But he heard Jesus teach a lot about prayer. There's a lot about prayer in the Gospel of John that Jesus mentioned and John recorded. He heard Jesus with his own lips say things like, until now, You've asked for nothing in my name, but ask and you receive and your joy will be full. In other words, it sounds like God wants to answer your prayers if you'll pray the right things. The condition that Jesus mentioned in the Gospel of John is that you pray in Jesus' name. Now, many of you might think that Jesus' name is just the Christian ending to prayer. But praying in Jesus' name means to pray the things that Jesus wants. You pray what Christ would pray. Now, verse 15 says that you can be confident that God hears you and you can be confident that God will answer you and that you'll have the requests that you've asked of God, but there is one important condition and maybe the most important condition for our prayer life, and that is at the end of verse 14, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So, sometimes prayer is viewed as bugging God enough and badgering him enough, backing him into a corner that we get what we want from him. That's not what prayer is. It's not positive thinking. It's not self-hypnosis. It's not insisting on our way to the Lord. That God only answers prayer that accords with his will. And so prayer is not figuring out what we want and asking God what we want. Prayer is figuring out what God wants and us asking what he would want for our lives. Now, some of you this time of year, in decades past, some of you parents in the room, you received a Christmas wish list from your kids. Sometimes they can get long. Do we got any people in the house today that grew up on those Sears catalogs? That was, that was the internet for the 80s, for the 70s and 80s. I remember surfing through that Sears catalog this big and hanging out in the toy section or the sporting goods section and just seeing all these things that I needed to make my life complete. Now, I don't know how it went in your household, but I didn't approach my parents with a big, long list of stuff they needed to give me because I already knew how that was going to go over. It was going to be a ham sandwich at a Hebrew picnic if I said... <laughs> I want all this stuff. Please get it for me. It wasn't flying. I'll get a few things here and there. But even if you could afford to give your kid everything they asked at Christmas and everything they asked for the rest of their growing up years, why did you not get it for them? Well, the answer is simple. It is not best for a kid to have everything they want. There's a whole lot of no's along the journey of life. Why do you think God doesn't give you everything you ask for in prayer? The same exact reason. 
It's not good for us to get everything we want. And we need a wise, sovereign, heavenly Father to tell us no sometimes. And God's no is for our ultimate good and for our protection. So it's up to us for us to learn to conform our prayer requests to things that God will say yes to. What will God say yes to? He will say yes to things that accord with his word. Some of you are going, well, that may be easy for some things, but not for everything. That's true as well. So when we know that we have a prayer request that accords with God's will, in other words, it's something that God is clear in Scripture that he wills for us, we pray confident that he will give us that which we've asked for. It should never cross our mind that God wouldn't answer a prayer request that accords with his will. We don't know when he'll answer, and we don't know how he will answer, but we know that he will answer, and we can pray with confidence that he'll answer. If there is an area of life where we're not sure what his will specifically is, we can still pray with confidence, but not, that, not confident that he will answer according to how we've asked, but we're confident he will answer according to his will. And we're confident in, in his ability to answer our prayer request. There are several examples of this, but one of them might be healing. I realize that there are incredibly well-meaning brothers and sisters that hold to a belief like this that say, it is always God's will to bring physical healing to his children in this lifetime. That is what some people teach. And we don't teach it at our church because I believe that that kind of teaching is based on proof texting scripture. There's a phrase at the end of the story of Christ or a phrase here. You piece it together with the Psalms and this, that, and the other. And you can assume that if you're a child of God, he always wants you to be well physically. Well, that's not the clear teaching of scripture. Remember what Alistair Begg said? The main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. Sometimes sickness is part of the plan for everyone. So what do we do when we don't know what God's will is for healing for someone who is sick? Well, we pray for their healing. We ask God for his healing. But can we have confidence? Yes, we can have confidence that God is able to heal and that God will do what he wants, but we are still confident. We just don't exactly know what his will is. So verse 14 and 15 needs a few other insertions from other places in the Bible about prayer. But don't forget that powerful antidote for selfish praying according to his will. Now, for the hard part. Verse 16 and 17. Well, one commentator describes this verse as a verse in which we have lost the key. Have you ever lost the key to your car? And You look for it everywhere and you can't find it. Sometimes you can't find it and you have to get a new key created, so to speak. But you're not getting in there, or you're at least not starting that vehicle without a key. And in some ways, the wording of verse 16 is never found in any other place in Scripture. And so the key to its understanding may have been lost in the first century. In other words, when everyone read 1 John 5, 16 in the first century, they're going, oh yeah, a sin that leads to death, a sin that does not lead to death, I got it. But here we are in 2022 in Central Florida going, say what? It doesn't mean to us what it meant in the first century. And so we're simply left with theories and explanations about what it possibly could mean. By the way, I would encourage you on areas where Scripture is not as clear and plain to resist unneeded dogmatism. This is exactly what this has to mean on areas where it's not as clear is an unwise posture. But... Without any further ado, let's look at verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is, a, there is sin that does not lead to death. So what you have described here is the intercessory prayer. You're praying for others. Specifically, we're told, if anyone sees a brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he should ask God and God will give him life. So, let's first of all say this. If you're praying for someone who is a fellow believer and they're struggling with sin, it doesn't mean that you're not struggling with sin too. It just means someone that you love, know, and care about is straying from the faith and you're burdened. What should you do? Should you get the gossip train going? Should you whisper about them in the foyer? 
Should you avoid them and go to the next aisle in Publix? What do you do to an erring, straying brother or sister? Obviously, we're to love them and reach out to them. But in verse 16, we're also to pray for them and trust that God's hearing us and will bring them back to the fall. Now, what is a sin that does not lead to death? It sounds like to me the best explanation is just any sin that believers commit. And in committing them, we're still alive physically. There's not a list of sins, that, and there's not, a, there's not good ones and bad ones. All sin uh, is lawlessness or is wrongdoing in verse 17. All sin is bad. So when there's a, a believer in our world that's straying, immediately the saints should pray. And it's okay to get others praying with you as long as your motives are good and as long as they're a trustworthy person that's not, you know, passing off prayer requests as some salacious way to get the scoop on someone struggling. So pray. Now, the bigger question is this. What is, at the end of verse 16, the sin that leads to death? Because John just said, I do not say pray for that person. That's something you don't hear in Scripture much. Is he saying, do not pray for them? I don't think there is a command here, don't pray for this person committing that kind of sin. I think he's trying to say, if they're committing a sin that leads to death, prayer for them will not be effective. Have you ever been to a church, maybe a Roman Catholic or Anglican church, and in the service there is a moment of prayers for the dead? You have never heard that in our church, and you never will. Do you know why? Because the Bible says it's appointed for man to die once, and after that to face judgments. It's not a biblical thing to pray for people that are physically deceased. And I think that's John's point, or part of John's point. Don't use prayers that have no efficacy. If they're not effective, if they're not going to work, they don't need to do them. So the question now remains is this. What is the sin that leads to death? Technically, my answer for you this morning is I don't exactly know. But I have a few thoughts on what it could be. Some have theorized that maybe he's referring to some big and massive, heinous, horrible sin. Doesn't seem to be much evidence for that. Others say maybe it describes someone's persistent refusal to receive the gospel. Therefore, they die spiritually and physically. But it sounds like in the context it's about a believer. So that's a difficult one. And another theory that's maybe has a problem because it also describes someone who's not a believer. Some say maybe this is describing someone who's committed what's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus healed someone, and onlooker said, you healed that through the power of Beelzebub or of Satan. And Jesus said, if you commit sins against me, or my father, you'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you'll never be forgiven. He didn't explain what he meant, but he seemed to be describing their attitude. And here is what blaspheming the Holy Spirit seems to be. It is the persistent rebellion that is so far removed from God that we describe something that is righteous as though it were unrighteous. And that sin can't be forgiven, not because God doesn't forgive, but because we are in a place where we likely would not repent and therefore receive God's forgiveness. By the way, I'd like to warn us that the culture we're living in is getting drastically close to, as a culture, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We're calling something that is good, the sanctity of human life, as if it is a moral evil to preserve the life of the unborn. And maybe in other areas as well, we have become a place that is getting dangerously close to, as a society, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But back to this verse a sin that leads to death. One other explanation, and it is the one that I have a slight preference for, although I still think the best answer is I do not know the key has been lost, is that John may describing a believer that persisted in sin to the point where he died physically, as though God may have given him a dishonorable discharge in this life because there was a lack of repentance. You may say, that sounds weird, and it does. And I, I don't hear me that I think we should ever sit there as a group of believers and theorize as to why someone died. That's not a, a kind thing to do or a biblical requirement of any type. But John may be describing someone that has died in persistent sin, and he's saying, you don't need to pray for that person because prayers aren't effective anymore. Examples of this kind of judgment could be Acts chapter 5, do you remember when Ananias and Sapphira 
They claim to have done something with a lot of land, and they lied to the church leaders. And, and Peter said they lied to the Holy Spirit, and they dropped dead. Boom. Right uh, in, in the midst of the church. And there was a judgment for the deceitfulness in their hearts. We don't know why exactly. It was the early church, and so maybe God was preserving his holiness and don't mess with God kind of moment. The reports in the book of First Corinthians where people died while persisting in their sin, while acting like everything was okay and taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and some died because of it. So it's possible that John is referring to that, and the takeaway from us about that is, hey, let's make sure that we stay as far away from sin as we can, because there is no telling what the Lord and His holiness and righteous may do in His judgment. So let's circle back out to the wider lens of prayer in verses 14 through 17 and simply remind ourselves this, that we should have confidence when we pray, especially when we know something is ultimately his will. We pray with confidence, trust him to answer it how he wants to, when he wants to. When we don't know what his will is, we pray with confidence that he will do what is best and that he is able to do all. And then when our brother is sin, sinning, we, we love them and we especially pray for a spiritual surgery to take place on their heart while we pray for our own soul as well. Now verses 18 through 21 is sort of a rapid fire succession of things we should know. And the third point on your outline this morning is this. We can know protection from the enemy. The enemy being the devil himself. Verse 18 says this. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but... He who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. So verse 18, the first part, is a review of something that confused us several months ago. In 1 John 3, 6 and 9, it says, Anyone born of God does not continue sinning. And we're in the room going, say, what? Anyone born of God doesn't continue sinning. Well, I keep sinning quite a bit. Does that mean I'm not born of God? And we had to kind of circle back out and remind ourselves that it does refer to, especially in the original language, as doesn't have the pattern of sinning. Remember when we're outside of Christ, we're dead in sin and we're slaves to sin. We cannot get out of sin. In Christ, you now have the freedom to not sin. And so what John is saying is that the pattern of our life is resistance of sin rather than being swallowed by sin, even though believers struggle with sin. I, I've said it this way in, in the past to you before, is that a true Christian can't sin successfully. I remember hearing the story of one of our men's mission graduates who was telling me, that he was involved in sort of dirty business practices as he was a part owner in, many business, in a business franchise. And he would go to a men's Bible study on a Friday morning, and he would go into a lunch meeting with some mafia folks in the afternoon, and he would pour himself into his addiction, and he was a professing Christian, felt like he knew Christ, but he had conviction everything he did and he wasn't any good at sinning because he came to the end of himself God brought him to repentance God broke him brought him to our men's care center and now he's joyfully and faithfully walking with God why because well the Lord protected him the Lord preserved him because he was of God and even though he wasn't representing God well for a season since he had the spirit of God in him God drew him back to the truth. But what is meant at the end of verse 18 when it says, and the evil one does not touch him? That's a little bit of a head scratcher because Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8 that, hey, be on your guard because the devil's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. And it's a little bit different sounding initially than what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. He says, hey, take up the shield of faith because the devil is firing all these darts at you. So what is it? Should we be aware because the devil's prowling and firing at us? Or do we just say the devil can't touch us? Well, part of it means of what is meant by the idea of the devil can't touch you. And the word touch translates into this, the devil can't lay hold of you. Did you ever sit in the back of the station wagon or the van with your brother and sisters and you touch your sibling? <laughs> Mom, so-and-so is touching me. I remember we had creative boys sometimes. They'd be in the back of the van with their finger over them. I'm not touching them, but they almost touched them. And sometimes they would graze their fingernail over, and it's not an official touch. So what does it mean? This verse can't mean that the evil one doesn't influence us or tempt us, right? But I think contextually what it means is if you're in Christ, Satan can't wrestle your salvation from you. 
can't dominate your life anymore because you're in Christ. Some have wondered, can a Christian be inhabited by an evil spirit? Can they be demon-possessed? And I think verses like this are very clear. No, they cannot. There may be different levels of oppression that we open and allow ourselves to by uh, opening up a cult uh, sort of accessibility in our life. And we certainly can be tempted by the enemy. But this verse is one to claim the evil one does not touch the children of God, doesn't lay a hold of the children of God. Verse 19, it says, but we know that we're from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil. We know that this world is temporarily run by Satan in a very temporal sense. It's governed in the ultimate sense by God. And th these verses are meant for us to have confidence in our Christian life and not to be in a defeatist and despair mode of operation. Imagine a city. Imagine Leesburg was an ancient city. And people from Claremont on one side and Tavares and, and the villages, of course, on another side, they surrounded us. They surrounded our city. And they were not letting anybody come in or out because they were practicing guerrilla warfare shooting at us. But let's say that some spy was able to sneak in and say, hey, the, uh, the Ocala, Claremont, Mount Dora, and Villages uh, collaboration has been defeated by the governor. <laughs> and he has taken them out. They haven't got the word yet, but they're already defeated. They just don't know they are. So they're just practicing sort of aimless guerrilla warfare at this holy city. And we live in a world that feels like the guerrilla warfare is nonstop. But I guarantee you, it's not, they're not going to win. <laughs> the defeat already happened at the cross and the resurrection. And so it's temporarily under the rule of the world. But believers can have confidence that the whole world is under the evil one. But we are from God. Now verse 20 gives us the fourth principle. And that's this, that we can know truth. L look how often the word truth or true is found in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So I think that the church who was, which was assaulted by false teaching, John is saying, don't listen to falsehood. Listen to Jesus. Listen to his word because that's where truth is found. I would caution you from finding these great truth revelations on YouTube and TikTok and to your best friend that doesn't really know anything about truth. They may be what Colossians 2.4 describes as fine-sounding arguments. But there's a difference between a, quote, fine-sounding argument and truth. John heard Jesus say the phrase, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. Truth is not a body of beliefs. Truth is a person. <laughs> and truth is Christ. And he's given us his word, a, a record of his truth. And so we'd have to know the truth to be able to discern the deceit. I read a story about the Northeastern School of Law that had 4,000 applicants for a semester that was only taking 260-something students. And one afternoon, all 4,000 students got an email of their acceptance to the school. Someone in IT was fired, I guess. <laughs> Five hours later, they get kind of a frantic email, all 4,000 people saying, we apologize for the error. That was not accurate. The real results will be given later. I'm just thinking about those poor law students. They're probably looking at lawsuits to file against the, the school of law because they're not going to know what on earth they can believe when that, when that letter comes to them in, on email. They're not going to know if it's true or false again. And some of, some of you have been lied to so much by the enemy and may be deceived by the church. Maybe a church that wasn't teaching right doctrine, you'd be deceived over and over again. And you're wondering, hey, what really is true? This verse reminds us that Jesus is the truth. And compare everything with him. Compare everything with his word. Now, do you ever have um, kind of, you ever have to end a conversation in a hurry and you didn't get to say what you meant to say? I'm not saying that's how 1 John ends, but I am saying it's how it sounds to us as it ends. Verse 21 says this, little children, keep yourselves from idols. That is a real rando ending <laughs> to a biblical book. Matter of fact, I like pa Paul's end of the letter going, hey, tell Sylvanus hello. We'll catch up later. Pray for me about this. It has a beautiful doxology. And then he signs out in the name of the Father. But this is like, hey, keep yourself from idols. I'm out. Mic drop. 
It's O's. Well, what's odd is he's not talked about idols for the whole, the whole uh, five chapters as we know them. He just says something that seems out of nowhere. But you would have to acknowledge that it was consistent with verse 20 about truth. In other words, don't find your satisfaction in idols, in cheap, sorry substitutes from God. Keep yourselves from idols and find all your satisfaction in God. Now, granted, he may have meant literal idols because there was a lot of Greek mythology and idolatry in the areas where they received this letter. But all an idol is is a sorry substitute for God. Um, Some of you, like myself, have tried to find a few products that are off-brands that are cheaper. And I've learned through the years which are Mrs. Lee approved off-brands and and ones that are not. (laughs) We're pretty particular about paper towels in our house. (laughs) If old Pastor Cliff finds a good old buy on those cheap paper towels... I'm pretty much, they're going to make good fire kindling after a while because they're not, they don't, this, and this sermon is not sponsored by Bounty or anything like that. I'm just saying. <laughs> we know that the cheap substitute paper towels don't get the job done. I got a question for you today that I heard someone ask one time, and it's this. Do you have any idols in your life? I was sitting in a Sunday school class. I was a college pastor, and I had several different teachers that were teaching our, our group, but this was like an off day. Uh, like a Christmas break, and the students were mostly gone. And so there's maybe 10, 15 students in the room and a few teachers in the back. And I was, uh, this is like my first full-time job after seminary. And I asked a teacher who taught uh, one class normally to, to teach the whole group, and it was a message on idols. If you're teaching a small group, by the way, I do hope that many of you will come to our Bible fellowship classes that meet at 945 before this or other ways to plug in on Wednesday nights to get more community in our church. But if you're leading a small group discussion class, you have to ask the right questions in order to get the group going, right? Unless your room is filled with extroverts, you can't just say, hey, guys, what do you think about Jesus? You know, do you love God? You're not going to really get anywhere with those open-ended questions. And this guy asked a kind of a stinker of a question. He said, hey, we're talking about idolatry today. Do any of you have any idols in your life? That's a pretty personal question, right? I mean, most of us are probably sitting there thinking, of, what can I say that sounds real but not too unspiritual. <laughs> I struggle with, with others that don't love Jesus sometimes. And occasionally I pray too much and care too much. We're kind of thinking of those things that, that might work. But there is another teacher in the back of the room. This, this was 25 or more years ago. And I think about it like it was yesterday. The guy raised his hands to the awkward question that nobody was answering. You could hear the crickets chirping. Do you have any idols in your life? A man raised his hand. He goes, yeah, I do. And He said, the teacher said, well, what is it? He goes, for me, it's money. He was a banker in town. And, of course, everyone's going, well, of course you struggle with money. You're a greedy, grubby businessman, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) But all of us have a struggle with greed in our lives. But it's not a big enough struggle for us to want to tell a small group about it, right? Try floating that one next time. Hey, pray for me because I'm really (laughs) envious and greedy of most of y'all. That doesn't fly. But this guy had the audacity to say, you know what, I put money in the place of God many times. He was basically saying, and I want to be free. And I guess my challenge to you is to ask yourself that question. Hey, are you putting something in the place of God? Do you let your affections run to money, run to people, run to places that will make you look and feel better? Is something else propping you up other than God? And sometimes the answer is really hard between you and God, yes. This is an idol for me. You can make a lot of good things an idol. You can make things that are generally helpful and positive, and you can ascribe more affection to them than you do to God himself. There have been journeys and moments in my life where I think I've made ministry, which I love to do, and I'm thrilled to be called to be a servant of the Lord. But if you're not careful, you can make serving the Lord an idol. You should be doing it for the Lord. You, good things, special blessings in your life can become idolatry if they are a cheap substitute for the living God. So the fifth principle on your outline is this, that we can know satisfaction in God. The, those idols don't satisfy because they're not real. And he was saying, hey, keep satisfied in God. Find all your streams in Christ rather than the cheap substitutes of the gods of this 